Hello, <laughs> uh, my name is Louise, I study French here and I'm going to be speaking about perceptions of mental illness in the late 19th century in France. So first of all, why should we be interested in this? Well, mental illness is increasingly becoming a hot topic in the media, not only in the UK, but across the Western world, especially with initiatives like Heads Together, which is a campaign um, fronted by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry, increasingly under the spotlight. So as we can see from these headlines, um, narratives about mental illness are sometimes really positive and sometimes quite negative, and they often overlap with other issues like government policy, etc. But these narratives must come from somewhere. In fact, many of these representations of mental illness can be traced back to the late 19th century in France and to institutions like this one. So this is the Hôpital pitié Salpetrière in Paris, it still stands, and during the late 19th century it was an asylum and a research institution, and a lot of um, physicians were focusing on a condition called hysteria at this time. Um, during this period as well, the discipline of psychiatry was really born, and there was a lot of interaction between the medical sphere and uh, literary, the literary world as well, as we'll see a little bit later. So what my research does is it basically reads medical texts from this period alongside fictional literature from this period to see how we, what we can basically find out from these texts about how mental illness was perceived at this time. So I started off looking at medical journals and with this man here, uh, this is Jean-Martin Charcot. He was a physician during the late 19th century and he was a specialist in hysteria. So he published um, about hysteria in many medical journals and he defined this as a condition which primarily affected women and which had many diverse symptoms but um, probably the main one was convulsions or fits. Um, he also gave many public lectures, so what we've got here is a painting by André Bruyer, and you can see Charcot here, he's giving a demonstration of a woman having a hysterical attack, and he's performing this to um, an audience of um, mostly medical men, but also authors, philosophers at the time as well. So among the audience members here is this man here, Emile Zola. He was also fascinated by hysteria. He was a writer during the late 19th century, he wrote many, many books. And because of his interest in hysteria, he wrote a book called The Fortune of the Rugons. And one of the characters in this book is called Adelaide, and she suffer for, for, suffers from hysteria as well. So when I had put these two texts side by side, I found that several recurring ideas kept coming up over and over again. So firstly, these texts tended to mention the family structure many times. And more specifically, they depicted mental illness as presenting a danger to uh, the family structure. As well as that, as I've already said, hysteria was considered to primarily affect women, and so that had a lot of implications for ideas about gender roles which were put across in these texts. And we can see that by how these texts talk about female sexuality and about reproduction, not from a male point of view, but from a female point of view. So I found these recurring ideas really interesting because of the context of these different texts. So there was a lot of concern during this period about several feminist organizations being established and women leaving the domestic sphere to pursue life in a public, more public sphere. There was also a lot of concern about depopulation as the population of France consistently declined over this century. And there was also a lot of anxiety about the institution of marriage breaking down. And there was a law in 1884 which was passed which re-established divorce in French law. There was a lot of debate about this. So finding these recurring themes just seemed quite interesting to me. And from this I managed to come up with a, a sort of thesis which says that basically the narratives that we see in these texts, in Zola's texts and in medical journals, seem to reflect how society was thinking about the family structure and also about gender roles. So if we start off with ideas about female sexuality that can be found in these texts. So many examples that I found um, seem to be very concerned about women having too much sex. And uh, there was a concern about excessive sexuality, basically. And we can see this in Zola's uh, novels. So the character Adelaide, who I mentioned, she starts an affair. She has no intention to marry um, her lover, whose name is Macar. 
And in fact, the lovers build a door which uh, conjoins their two properties. They have ease of access between the two. And this causes an absolute scandal in the community. And because of this choice to, to start an affair and to build a door, um, her neighbours call her quite mad and argue that she should have been locked away years ago. So what we can see here is that the fact that Adelaide is having an extramarital affair is an indicator of her mental illness to her um, neighbours. We can see real similarities between this perspective and also um, ideas that can be found in medical journals. So I've got a quote here from a medical journal which was giving a, a court, it was basically a court case. And in the court case, the doctors were trying to prove that the woman who was being accused of the crime couldn't be held responsible because she was hysterical. And the proof that they gave for this diagnosis was the fact, not that she had lovers, but that she had a reputation for having lovers. So again, <laughs> um, too much female sexuality was considered an indicator of mental illness. And it's worth noting that in both of these texts, male patients and the male characters, their sexual lives are either not revealed or they're lauded and praised. So for men, you have um, their sexuality is considered an, uh, associated with virility, whereas for women, it's an indicator of requiring treatment. So, <laughs> so what we've got in these examples is an image of femininity that looks a lot like this. So too much female sexuality is dangerous, but actually so is too little. After her lover dies in Zola's novel, um, Adelaide descends into madness, and this is emphasised by the fact that she's referred to as a nun or compared to um, a nun several times over the course of this. So you can see that she's compared to uh, a pale-faced old nun, she's compared to a young girl forced to en enter a convent. Uh, so really emphasising her celibacy and how this is extreme. Um, Again, very similar in medical journals. In most of the case studies which accompanied uh, female patients' details, uh, the doctors tended to um, provide information about the patient's religious backgrounds. This was not provided for many male case studies at all. So here we can see that the fact that the patient was raised in a convent and that that might imp impact her ideas about piety and sexual sexuality might maybe be considered um, a, con a contributor to her mental illness. So in these examples, mental illness looks a lot like this, which is a bit different. We also see a real preoccupation with reproduction at this time, which is really interesting because there was a lot of current concern about depopulation, about the decline, the slow decline of the, of the French population. And this concern was really not ascribed to men in these texts. Um, it tended to correspond a lot with the female reproductive system. So if we look at Zola's text, Mental illness tends to correspond with interruptions to the menstrual cycle. So with the character of Adelaide, when she has her pregnancies, she has uh, these nervous attacks and these terrible convulsions, which sound a lot like what Shako was describing when he talked about hysteria. And then after her pregnancies, these convulsions return once a month, which implies that they're tied up in some way with her menstrual cycle. Meanwhile, um, in medical journals, uh, uh, a theory of hysterogenic zones was being developed by Charcot. So he claimed that by compressing these areas of a female body, which are indicated by the black ovals, um, that a hysterical attack could be brought on, ceased altogether, aggravated. Basically, you could control a hysterical attack by compressing these areas. So as we can see, these areas are literally mapped onto a female body, not a male body, and they collate around the ovaries and the breasts, again indicating a preoccupation with reproduction. So what we've been given are two very extreme versions of femininity, and both are considered to be sick. So what does that leave us for healthy womanhood? Well, I would say that if this is sick and this is sick, then what is left is a perfectly moderated woman, a woman who is married, a woman who wants children, a woman who is totally devoted to her family, i.e. a woman who completely conforms with the gender roles of the, the gender norms um, of the day. So how does this relate to the family structure? Well, during this period, there was a lot of concern about the family unit deteriorating. And we can see this in Emil Zola's novel, in which he really ties concerns about familial deterioration in with mental illness worsening. 
So at the start of the book, Adelaide's husband dies, and this leaves her with a fatherless child. She then starts an affair, which, as we've seen, um, contributes to her mental illness, it aggravates it. She then has two more children who are illegitimate. And because of her mental illness, she is unable to care for or guide these children, leaving them without a traditional father figure and a traditional mother figure. So we don't really have an ideal family structure um, in this novel, and that's really tied in very, very clearly with her mental illness. In medical journals, uh, this can be compared with, with medical journals' discussion of infanticide. So there are several case studies of uh, parents, mostly mothers, attempting to murder or murdering their children. And this is one example that I found. Um, the repetition of the fact that the mother felt that the child was a bother to her, that she wanted to get rid of the child, really emphasises the fact that there was a concern about a loss of maternal feeling at this time and a loss of the traditional mother figure. Ultimately, in both of these texts, mental illness is, is depicted as a threat to the family unit. The message is really clear that you cannot be both mentally ill and have an ideal family structure. So what I hope I've demonstrated is that medical literature and fictional literature from the late 19th century in France reflect how the society were thinking, was thinking about um, gender norms and the family unit. But why is this important? This happened over 100 years ago. We've all moved on. We're far different now, right? Well, I just want to go back to these headlines. I think that this research gives some context for how we now think about uh, modern day understandings of uh, mental illness. So although we may not make these really direct links between gender roles and mental illness, can we really say that our perceptions of mental illness aren't still gendered? And even though we don't think overtly that um, mental illness presents a threat to the family structure, do we not still put across the idea that mental illness presents a threat in some way to society? So I really hope that what these narratives do is encourage, what this presentation will do is encourage people to read between the lines of these narratives and ask themselves what they reveal about what we think, not only about gender and about the family, but also about many other factors like class, religion, race, etc. So thank you very much for listening and can I take any questions?